today we're going to talk a bit about Drupella snails. And the reason why we're talking about these guys is they are a major threat to reefs around the Indo-Pacific, a, a kind of newer threat, um, just starting to spread out around different areas of the Indo-Pacific. And they're the kind of organism where, you know, you can dive in an area for ages, for, for years, and never really notice them. Um, but once someone points them out to you, then you realize just how abundant they are on the reef. Um, they're literally everywhere. They're just very cryptic, very well camouflaged, and they tend to stay um, in, hidden within the coral structure. So they are a, um, what we call a, a muricid snail, and um, we have several species. They range in size up to about, I think the largest ones are about five centimeters, but most of the ones that we find um, are generally le less than about three centimeters in size. Um, and morphologically, they stay pretty much the same um, from juvenile to adult, but oftentimes their shell does get covered over in the calcareous coral and algae, the CCA, that we see like this one here with all that purple covering it. And that CCA, of course, also covers, you know, most of the rubble and a lot of the non-living structure of the reef. So they blend in very, very well with that kind of camouflage with that organism growing on top of them. So just where are they placed um, the, in the systematics of them? They are in the phylum mollusks. So they're with the bivalves that we talked about yesterday, the giant clams, um, the octopuses and squid and all that. But they're going to be in the class gastropoda, which of course means stomach footed, um, comes from the Greek word stomach and foot. And so they're the ones who kind of walk on their stomach. This includes all the snails and, sh and um, slugs and, and nudibranchs and things that we like like that. And then they're in the family here, Myricidae and the genus Drupella. And most of this genus is actually not coralivorous. Um, and most gastropods, of course, are not coralivorous, which is, you know, kind of surprising when we look at coral reefs, how abundant and diverse they are. Very few of the animals that actually live in coral reefs eat corals. And this is again highlighted in this family when we look at Drupella. So we can see down here, this family of Drupella originated about 9 million years ago um, in the late Miocene and um, has diversified. Um, I think there's something like, doesn't not shown here, but I think there's something like 12 species at the moment. And um, only four of them are coralivorous. Um, we have Rugosa, Ibernina, uh, Cornus, and Fragum. But then we also have one, the Margarita cola, and that one's kind of an opportunistic coralivore. So it doesn't necessarily go out and try to find corals to eat, but if it encounters a coral which is already being predated upon by other species of Drupella, then it will advantageously take um, eat, eat that. Um, so normally it's, it's you know, I mean, drilling and scavenging, but um, if it finds a stressed out coral, it will eat it as well. Um, so we have those, those five species. Most of the species of snails, of course, are not coralivorous. And although in this talk, I'm going to refer to them as coralivores, um, you know, organisms that eat corals, a lot of the times they'll also be referred to as ectoparasites um, or, or external parasites. Um, eating the corals. So, so both of the terms are correct. And I think that a lot of the scientific community is now moving more towards ectoparasitic snails. But for most of, you know, my, my school and everything, they, we would call them coralivores. So I'm going to stick with that just for ease of this lecture. But just know that sometimes they are known as ectoparasites and it's not wrong. Um, so they are in the areas where they are, they are highly um, abundant. So what we find is that they tend to aggregate. So they tend to live all together. So you might swim across a huge, vast swath of reef, not seeing a single one of them. And then when you do find one, you're generally not, you're going to find a bunch of others, as we can see in this photograph. Um, you can kind of see them all around this photograph. The easiest place to see them, of course, is where we find the recently killed coral, the white coral branches. And then we can look for this cryptic snail here. And what it's going to do most often is kind of retreat down to the, kind of the base of the coral during the daytime. And then at night, it'll work its way up around the coral branch feeding. And they can eat around 1.8 centimeters of coral 
per day. So it's not a huge amount of coral that they're eating per individual, but we can sometimes find tons of individuals on a single coral. So they can consume tons of coral. Um, they live about 45 years. So in their lifetime, one snail will eat this, an area that's about the size of a queen size bed. Uh, that sticks in my mind. Um, so you add that all up, it's a lot of beds. It's a lot of coral gone. And when they do kind of settle down, um, even though they are pelagic larvae, they tend to settle in cohorts. So often what we'll find is these huge groups of juveniles inside of like, for example, this tabulate coral. Um, this is very frequent what we'll find them. And they basically kind of all settle down on one side of the coral and just eat their way through to the other side. And uh, it's very hard for, you know, predators to get at them. Uh, they're, they're pretty secure in there, not too much danger to, to them. So the snails, a little bit about their life stages. This life stage is going to be very important. We talk later about why they're problematic. So they have benthic egg stage. So the snail will mate with other snails and then it will lay egg cases onto um, some dead coral or rubble. And that um, once those hatch, then they become pelagic larvae. So they'll develop within the water column, kind of floating about, but they'll try to stay more or less as a cohort. So the ones that kind of hatch together will, will travel together and settle down. And this is quite incredible because as pelagic larvae, you know, they might settle down quite near their parent population, but there's been some studies showing that they can travel as far as 180 kilometers and then settle as a cohort, which is I think pretty incredible. Um, they reach maturity after about two and a half to three and a half years sexual maturity. So then they'll start reproducing. And once they start reproducing, they can put out about 160,000 embryos per spawning event. And they can have one or two spawning events per year. And they can live up to 45 years. So if you kind of do the math there, that's a whole lot of embryos that each individual is putting out during their lifetime. So we can assume that if they're putting out, you know, millions of embryos per individual, very few of those are surviving. So it is our selection. Um, this paper that we did, who I want to say, two, it was 2017. Um, we actually identified the first case of Drupella eggs being laid in the wild. And this comes after um, another paper was published out of Singapore by Dr. Sam, who had witnessed it in, in, um, in, in Aquaria. And so once he had published and shown us pictures of them, then we went back through our old photographs and found out that we had seen them egg, their egg cases quite frequently. Um, so we had published on that in 2017 is the first observation of their egg deposition. So these are those benthic egg cases that I mentioned. And each one of these kind of like donut or like it's like red blood cells to me is full of hundreds or thousands of eggs. So these are all like egg cases. And then when these hatch, it'll become pelagic larvae. Now the larvae will go through several stages. Um, within the first day, they'll become what's called a, a trochophore. So if you were in our uh, giant clam lecture last night, then you would have learned about them. Um, they're kind of the intermediate step it looks like a, a ciliated kind of a double pyramid structure that most of the mollusks actually start off their life as. So even though the, the giant clams when they're adults look very different from the Drupella, when they're larvae, they look identical. Um, after about 12 hours to a day, then the Drupella larvae will become what we call a villager. And so that's what we have here. Um, and it's basically kind of like a, a bivalve, snail kind of combo thing. And from there, it'll start to, in the giant clams, also have this villager state, but it'll become the bivalve. And from the, for the, the Drupella, then it goes down a different route and becomes kind of what we would identify as like a, looking a bit like a snail um, by this stage, which takes about 15 days. So at this stage is going to settle down, leave the water column and find like, you know, a nice coral or some other thing to settle down upon and start consuming and growing. So we can see a little bit, we mentioned before, like, you know, how um, they'll put out in their lifetime millions and millions of embryos, but 
very little of them should survive. Um, you know, when we have a spawning event, not all of the eggs are going to be fertilized. So already we're going to cut that population down. If we were to say, you know, this is 100% of the gametes that are released during spawning, then not all of them are going to make it um, to the next stage, which is that pelagic development stage that happens for like 15 days. And during that pelagic development stage, we're going to lose a lot more. We're going to lose them to starvation. Um, we're going to lose them to predation. They're going to get dispersed. They're going to end up, some are going to end up in the bottom of the deep ocean and just going with the currents and that kind of stuff. So again, we're going to lose a bunch going to the next stage, which is the settlement metamorphosis stage. And then from there, again, we're going to have starvation, disease, predation, lots of uh, negative factors affecting these juveniles. So very few of them are able to grow um, from the juvenile stage to the adult stage. And if they're able to kind of survive those, what we call it teenage years and get to the reproductive stage, um, they're kind of one of a kind, you know, one in a million. Um, so that most of that population that we start with does not become a reproductive adult. And that's this R reproductive strategy that we see with a lot of invertebrates. Um, they're just kind of throwing out as much genetic material out there as possible and hoping that something sticks. And we'll come back to this a little bit later, why it's, it's vital in, in the conservation of these or of the reefs. So with a lot of predators, when we talk about, let's say like crown of thorns or something like that, then we wanna talk about their preferred prey species because when they come into an ecosystem, then the, when they start removing species, they change the population structure of the reefs. So it may not be that they eat every single coral on the reef. Um, they may have preferred prey species and they might go after those species first. And we see with Drupella that it's quite similar um, to like the crown of thorn starfish in terms of their diet. So they eat a lot of the fast growing corals like Montipora, Acropora, those types of corals, the ones that are investing a lot of energy into growth and not a lot of energy into defense and immune health. Um, and also is nice for the Drupellas because the Acroporas are also structurally very complex. It makes it a bit hard for the crown of thorns, but for the Drupella, it provides them with not only food, but shelter, um, a hiding place as well to kind of, for their cryptic nature. But what we've found, although a lot of the, the studies out there, you know, in the 70s and 80s would say that Drupella prefer Acropora and Montipora. And so for a lot of the kind of two decades, everybody thought that's where you had to look for them and that's all they would eat. And then they would remove those and we'd be left with the other corals of, big change in population structure. What we've found is we've actually found them on just one island on 18 different genre of corals. Um, and I think it, if I remember right, is about 42 species within those 18 genre um, of corals that they feed upon. So we want to kind of, with, with this publication we did um, back in 2016, tried to express that these organisms have a high dietary plasticity. Um, they're not just eating the Acropora and Montipora. We've in fact found them on many different genre of corals. But, you know, a lot of this, you know, um, information, the reason why we've been able to, to publish so much new information is that really not a lot is known about the Drupella snail. They were kind of not on the radar until about the 1970s or 1980s. Prior to that, we do have very sparse descriptions of them. So they were, you know, they were first discovered in the 1800s and described. But when we look at old papers, you know, where people are going, um, especially um, scientists from England go out and, and, and are going to different areas and just kind of cataloging everything that's there, we don't really find descriptions of Drupella for many of the areas throughout the Indo-Pacific going back in those old records. However, today we are finding them more and more. Um, so, so yeah, so to continue on that, um, you know, we weren't finding them, we weren't finding descriptions of them, and often that's because they occurred in a very low abundance. Um, so naturally, and according to the literature, there should be about less than one individual per 10 square meters of reef. 
and that would be like a, a healthy population of Drupella. Um, but of course, we wouldn't find them spread out like that. We would generally find them all on one coral. So all the Drupella within a kilometer of reef might be on a single coral. So they do naturally occur in these aggregations. So when we find them, sometimes it is a bit alarming um, when you find them all on one coral, like in this photograph, um, eating that coral. But it's important to remember that, you know, the surrounding kilometer of reef has very few of them. So it's not a really big deal. But sometimes, um, and more and more around the world, what we're finding is that they are becoming a big deal. Um, rather than finding, you know, on a kilometer, square kilometer of reef, one aggregation of Drupella snails, we're finding multiple aggregations of Drupella snails. And in some area, they are decimating the reefs. Um, we find them just everywhere. So the first outbreak was recorded in 1982 in Japan. And from there, we've had lots of outbreaks um, being um, reported from kind of that whole area of the Indo-Pacific, all the way from the Red Sea to Western Australia, um, Kenya, Hong Kong, Thailand. Um, we can kind of see this graphically on this map here. This is in the 1970s, according to the literature. The only place we had found an outbreak of them is in the southern part of Japan. Um, by the 80s, we had also found them, um, I forget which reef it was, on, in, the, in, in Australia. I think it was in the Nigaloo Reef. And then we started finding them in Kenya, Red Sea, um, and then in the 2000s, we um, were the first to describe an outbreak of Drupella in the, in the Gulf of Thailand. So they are becoming more, um, more frequent, more severe, more abundant um, in many places around the globe. Now, like the crown of thorns, I, I use the crown of thorns picture here um, because there's a lot been a lot more research on the crown of thorns. And when we start to look at Drupella, we're finding that they are quite similar in the reasons why we're finding these outbreaks. So both of the organisms, Drupella and crown of thorns, have very few natural predators in their adult stage. However, in their larval stage, everything eats them. Um, they are zooplankton in their larval stage. So they'll be eaten by corals, giant clams, and filter feeding fish and snappers and everything else um, that feeds on plankton is going to feed on them. Um, so that's one reason why um, we start to see them increasing in populations is a lot of those organisms that I just mentioned are being depleted. Um, there's much less of them than previously. So when we talk about predators in this case, we're mostly talking about predators in the larval stage. Um, once they get to the adult stage, they're pretty robust, pretty resilient, not much can get at them. So that's the first reason why we're starting to see overpopulations of the sea star and the Drupella snails. The second one, remember when we showed that graph where we had um, all of the larvae coming out and showed most of them don't survive to the reproductive age, and a lot of them died due to starvation. And what they are eating in their larval stage um, and, and part of their juvenile stage is phytoplankton. So they are filter feeders within the water column themselves. And so if they're in very clean, crystal clear waters, then there's very little for them to eat. However, if they're in eutrophic waters where there's lots of you know, unicellular mac uh, microalgae and um, phytoplankton in the water, then they're not going to starve. Many more of them will survive to adulthood. Now, if, if we only, if we're starting with you know, several million and ending up with a couple dozen, and we only increase that efficiency by one or 2%, we end up with a whole lot more reproductive age individuals, a whole lot more adults. So it's this kind of interplay between removing the predators and increasing the success of the juveniles by altering water quality that's really leading to the outbreaks and, and, and overpopulations of Drupella snails, just like with the crown of thorn starfish. And so there's a lot of um, papers and research on the starfish, not so much on the Drupella snails, but what we have found and, and what most of the research points to is that their very similar early life history um, leads to these overpopulations based on, on anthropogenic changes in the reef and in the, the ocean itself. So we are the cause of these outbreaks, unfortunately. 
Um, and as we become more of a threat towards the earth and, and more of an impact on the oceans, then these threats are also becoming more exaggerated in these areas. But there's other ways um, that they can lead to an overpopulation, which has um, been largely kind of ignored in the management side of things. So we want to go ahead and go through that a little bit. So how else can Drupella snails become overabundant in the same way as other coral avores? And the way that that happens is not necessarily that the Drupella snails population increases, but the population of their prey, coral, decreases. So that's, you know, when we look at this photograph, we've got uh, prior to the bleaching in 2014 and the same area after the bleaching of 2014 on the right hand side there. And we can see we've lost all of our resources. So what could survive a lot, I mean, what could um, provide food for a lot of snails before can no longer provide that much resources for them. So this is getting into what we call regime shifts in ecosystems. And with coral reefs, this is kind of a concept that unfortunately we talk about a lot these days. Um, and it's the idea that, you know, a, an ecosystem in a steady state kind of wants to stay as that type of ecosystem. So it's kind of like in this first picture here where we have this little ball and it's down in this little trowel, kind of like a little cup. So if we had a tsunami, we have waves, we have a warm year, it's going to shake up this cup a little bit. But it, the ball has to go very high up the edges to actually get out of that cup, right, to change to a different type of ecosystem. So even though we get minor disturbances that shake this up and that ball goes from one side to the other, it never falls out. But when we start to stress this ecosystem, then we're re reducing the resilience of the ecosystem. The resilience is its ability to withstand or come back from disturbances. So basically, as we stress out this ecosystem more and more, then we're reducing the depth of that kind of cup there, that trowel that that ball's in. When we do that, what we're doing is we're making it more kind of precarious. Um, we're taking that ecosystem that's very resilient and can withstand these major threats and we're putting it to a place where maybe a little threat can push it up over that edge and it drops down into this trowel. Um, you know, graphically, what we talk about there is the loss of the coral ecosystem, maybe a regime shift to an algal ecosystem or a rocky area, sand, something else, uh, or just like a, a algal forest, basically. So this is kind of the idea of this. Um, what's going on, and Drupella snails are a major part of this. So according to the literature, um, you know, there's not much description of what is an outbreak of Drupella snails, what's too, how much is too much, essentially. Um, there are papers that describe it as somewhere, if it gets to about 6.4 individuals per square meter, um, which is, is a whole lot, I think, um, way too much. It depends and that doesn't take into account how much coral you have. So if we're in the coral triangle and we're dealing with an area that has, let's say 80% coral coverage, then one individual per square meter might not be a huge deal. That little individual is gonna eat 1.8 centimeters squared of, of coral tissue per day, but you know the corals are growing and they're repairing and this little snail is not gonna do too much of a damage. Now, if we're in an area that has only 10% coral coverage and we have one snail per every meter squared, then that's going to be a really big deal. And if in a very short period of time, it might eat all of the coral in that square meter. So we need a definition that does not just focus on the abundance of snails, but also focuses on the abundance of resources. So that's very important. So we have to take into account how much coral coverage there is, what's the population structure. I mean, if they're going after certain species and we don't have much of that species left, then maybe it's problematic. Um, and we have to look at basically their balance versus the balance of the resources. Um, and we'll go through some of these other reasons in the moment, but um, basically at the moment, there's very little um, to, little information out there to direct reef managers about when to worry about Drupella snails and uh, how to actually manage them. 
So this is what I mean by we have to not just look at the abundance of the snails, but we have to look at the resource abundance. And it's the ratio of snails to resources that's really important. And unfortunately, this was you know, kind of lost in the literature for a few decades um, when it comes to snails, at least. But you know, this, this graph we can look at, this is like our abundance of our organism. So in here, we're talking about Drupella snails, but you know, just to make it more uh, you know, able to kind of visualize, we could think about this like something on land like rabbits or, or deer. Let's, let's go with rabbits. So the rabbit population, you know, if everything's good, then it continues to increase. So the rabbit population continues to increase and eventually it exceeds the resource availability. So let's say the, the grass that the rabbits like to eat. There's too many rabbits for the grass that continues to go up and then we get starvation. So the population of rabbits drops and then there's a lot more grass than there are rabbits. So it starts to come up again. And that's kind of what we have. We call this often in, in ecology, like the carrying capacity. But essentially the, the abundance or the population of most organisms tends to bounce up and down above and below the carrying capacity. And when it's above it, we'll call that an outbreak. But we can also have an overpopulation. So for example, what happened in 2014, when we saw that first photo where all the corals died, um, we had a situation like here where we had a lot of Drupellas, but you know, we weren't that concerned. Um, we saw them, we found the aggregations, we were monitoring them, they were included in our, our monthly monitoring um, and research. So we, we were keeping an eye on them, but it was kind of like they were right under um, their resource abundance. We, we weren't worried, they were not a problem. But then the bleaching happened and bleaching kills corals. So our resource abundance, the food for the Drupella, suddenly went down, right? So we went, the, the population of Drupella didn't change at all but the resource abundance changed. So we went from a situation where we were under the carrying capacity to a, a situation where we're suddenly above it. And that is basically what the overpopulation is um, that, that we experienced on our reefs and that many other reef managers have also reported around the Indo-Pacific, especially as we start to factor in climate change and bleaching and these um, frequent bleaching events. So the other thing we want to think about external, and I mean external to the population of, of snails, um, is looking for other signs that maybe they're becoming problematic. And one of those that we've identified is when their prey species of food changes. They really see a shift in their preferred, preferred prey species. So for example, um, prior to the bleaching event of 2010, we were finding all the Drupella snails in our area on table corals and some branching and, and coriombos, but it was exclusively on Acropora corals and a couple of Montipora corals. Then we had the bleaching event of 2010. That was a global bleaching event. And on our reefs, we lost quite a bit of coral. I'll show you a, a graph in a moment. But what we found was that the Acropora were the hardest hit in that bleaching event. And at the end of the bleaching event, the snails had many of them a large amount of them had migrated from eating the acropora, which were largely dead, to feeding upon the fungia, the mushroom corals around the reef. So you can see in this graph here, um, this, the, the bottom area here where you see this green um, out deep and then a red area more shallow, um, this indicates the amount of coral that we lost in the bleaching of 2010. This is in our survey area. So in this area, this is called Chilok Van Kao. And where you see this red, we lost about 60% of the corals and this was all branching corals. This is where that photo was taken, um, where it's just this huge, basically a uh, field of branching corals. So what we found um, that we published about was that all the Drupella snails moved from all the branching corals and these shallow branching corals out to the fungia, the mushroom corals that were a little bit deeper. And what we would find is you might find a couple on top or sometimes um, you might just see like the scars like in this one. And then you turn it over and there are just hundreds of Drupella snails underneath here. And what they do is in the daytime, they hide underneath these fungids. And then at night they come out and, and eat a bit and then retreat back in when the sun starts coming up. 
So we could go around and turn these corals over and just find hundreds or thousands of Drupella snails under here. And this is uh, also where we, we found their egg cases in here. Um, so this was a dietary shift. Um, and this kind of is something that highlights that big changes are going on in their populations and that maybe we need to start worrying about them a little bit. Uh, and, and just showing you a bit more. I mean, this was the easiest time to go and collect them because you could literally just go around, look for a, a mushroom coral that had dead on its top surface and grab your bag, open your bag up, and then pick up the, the mushroom coral and just dump all these all these snails into your bag. Um, so very easy collection, but um, we were not able to make a dent in their populations and we lost a lot of the mushroom corals in this area. And if you know about mushroom corals, they're a pioneer species. So when you look in this area, it used to be a nice branching coral um, reef. It died due to bleaching in 1998 it became all rubble and now it'd stay all rubble or it'd go to sand, except that these fungi are able to live here and they are kind of the pioneer species. These fungi are able to live in a dynamic environment as they grow up larger and then die, other corals settle on them and they become the kind of crystallization point for an entire new reef. Um, so this is setting back, these drupellas are you know, kind of contributing in 2010 to the death of the reef that happened all the way back in 1998. Um, so these things just keep, you know, they're always linked together, um, keep coming again and again. Oops. Um, and so just to show you a little bit about Kotao and, and the Drupella populations there, um, this is in our monthly surveys. This is all of our sites, uh, I think 13 different sites, or no, I'm sorry, seven different sites averaged together. And we just kind of, if you were to extend this out, this is only, you know, five years here. Um, or six years, sorry. But once you, if you were to keep extending this out, our populations of Drupella just keep increasing there. And they're mostly on the shallow reefs. Um, we don't find them too often on the deep reefs. Um, and the shallow reefs, of course, are where we find a lot of the fast growing corals that they're preferred prey species. All right, so they're eating the corals. They're changing the population structure of the reef. Um, and another thing that they're doing, unfortunately, is transmitting disease. So there's been several papers that have come out. Um, initially, people were finding them associated with disease, but now there also have been some papers that have come out that have showed that they are indeed transmitters of disease. So they set up some experiments with aquariums and different corals and different, different tanks and um, some diseased, and then they move the drupellas around. And lo and behold, the um, corals in the, in the tanks where you put the drupellas um, got the brown band disease. So it has only been proven with brown band disease, um, not with black band disease or other diseases, but very oftentimes we'll see brown band disease and tropellus together. And it's hard to kind of say, you know, that it's kind of a who came first kind of deal. Um, the drupellus are attracted to stressed out corals. Um, drupellus, like other corallivores, can actually detect amino acids released by the stressed coral in the water and, and go and find it. Um, the crown of thorns do this, butterfly fish do this, and, and other organisms do as well. Um, so if a coral becomes diseased, then it's going to attract the drupella because it's releasing these stressed amino acids. Um, but also when the drupella start eating it, then it's releasing more of those acids, more drupella are going to come. So it kind of is this positive feedback loop that occurs. So for a very long time, it was hard to say. We knew that there was correlation between drupella and disease, but we didn't know that there was causation. And um, just in the last few years, I think this paper was from 2014, then we had found out that they are um, a vector for disease transmission. So many problems associated with these little snails. Um, and so what we have to do, um, unfortunately, is start to try to remove some of them. 